Hello, this is Trinant, and I'm going to do a walkthrough of what a combat and operational combat series looks like. I did a fair bit of overrun combat in my movement phase here, but I figured I'd talk in detail about how that kind of combat works uh, in this step. I'm going to just do this one segment's worth of combat, uh, namely this grouping. There's a lot more on the map. Uh, to do after this, but I figured that a simple walkthrough of what's happening here might uh, clarify how some of this works. So, there is a giant chart first off to look at. We'll see how that goes, but first uh, thing, actually said chart has a nice combat sequence summary. So OCS has a lot of charts and tables, so it has this, and then you can flip it, so even more, and then you can flip it again, and even more. But important to us is the combat sequence summary right here. Um, First, the attacker identifies the defending and attacking hexes. That's pretty straightforward. I point out what's attacking where, and we are going to do... And before I do that, I'm going to take a gander at the terrain I'm about to encounter, because while I cannot uh, inspect a stack directly, I can look at what their terrain is like, and I kind of cheated there because of the tripping, but that's okay. I also totally forgot that there's a garage segment with artillery right before this, but I'm not going to partake in that yet. Uh, let's make sure there's no open ground here. There is. Ooh. I take that back. So before you do um, combat, you can do artillery barrages, and artillery in range can be fueled to do a bombardment. Um, artillery has yellow coded numbers on the left. That is their barrage rating. They do not have combat ratings printed on them, though they technically do have a combat rating of one, I want to say. This bottom number that says a three, it's really tiny on there. There's two middle numbers on uh, artillery units. The top one is their action rating, and the bottom middle number is their range. And we could do an artillery barrage of this, but I do want to check my supply before I do so, because artillery does cost supply. Or on our ground artillery. Aircraft is nice that it's kind of free. That would be 42 barrage strength. That would be one and a half supply to uh, supply points to fire that, but it could be worth it. Yeah, so we're going to do a barrage first off. Uh, let's take a look at my barrage. Yeah, I do have enough supply points over here to pull it off. So we're going to take six tokens worth of supply, which is going to reduce this down to uh, one, three, one and one token, it looks like. Grab my supply points. And we will do a very, very strong barrage. So the barrage table, the way this works is you look at the column that the barrage is on and adding the artillery here and here together to target that, and it should have range. Now this only has a range of one, so never mind. It might have to do a less than that artillery. Still, might be worth it. Ooh, no, I can do that instead. That would be a 52 strength barrage. Still six tokens. We're going to barrage that hex with these two artillery. Need to fuel them, fuel them. Um, so I look at this cup table here, 
And I do, I look at the column that the barrage strength is on. It's on that one. And then I'm going to do some shifts. Um, I check to see if it's in close or very close terrain. That is an open spot, so no. Um, there has to be a spotter, and there is. Spotters are just units that are adjacent. Um, then I shift to the right if, uh, if it's an aircraft, and it's not, so we don't care about that. Uh, the density of the hex, so how many units are stacked in there, also can affect the barrage rating. And a density of three does no column shifts. If it was smaller than that, it'd be one to the left. So basically, I'm shifting the column of the strength I'm rolling. So I have six tokens of supply. Basically, anything but a two is going to net me a result here. So I'm going to roll three dice, because there's a chance I'll roll a third dice on this. So we'll have to cut here. I rolled an eight with a two. The two is going to be nothing, but the eight and then I check this little chart, an eight on this column is a one and a half chance that the thing takes a step loss, but it will be disorganized. As it stands, I, that black die I rolled was a two. It should be a four or higher to disorder to kill it. Now, I also mentioned disorganized before, but what it does is it halves the combat value uh, and movement value, if I think, of the units in that stack. Uh, and that's really, and it reduces their action rating by one as well. Really useful. So I spent a lot of supply points there, but I think it'll be worth it, hopefully. And then, the only problem is that I'm planning on attacking that stack in the open. So really I, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It stops me from having a counterattack. Uh, I only have enough units really to attack one of these hexes safely. So really I overdid it, but that's okay. Should have saved my supply, but I didn't. All right, well, now for the actual combat step. Combat segment, if you will. So uh, I choose the hexes I'm attacking. These two are going to attack this hex. They have to attack an adjacent hex. Um, the next step is both players respend, expend their required supply points. I have to spend one token for um, each regimental equivalent, or rather for each units. Yeah, the cost is one token per attacking step. That would be one, and then this looks like four, but it actually has taken a step loss. So it's three, so that's four tokens there, or one supply point. Um, Let's spin that supply point from here. Whee. And then the defender has to expend their supply points. Um, and they will expend it from here, likely. And the cost is always just two tokens for a defender, unless they have a small group, like uh, one regimental equivalent or less. This is a larger group than that, so it'll cost two tokens, which nets this guy down to two and three tokens here on this stack. Okay. So they expend supply. So attack, attacking always requires supply points. Now, I could, with the exception that I could uh, eat into the internal stocks of an attacker, uh, and that attacker could just, um, oh, that reminds me, I forgot a supply step. I'll, get, I'll mention that later. Uh, so essentially, I could um, 
uh, eaten to the reserve ammunition of a unit's combat stuff, their bullets. But the downside to that is during the supply phase, they have to um, eat double the amount of uh, supply they would normally need to restore that, and they automatically must do that. So if you have supply tokens on the map, that actually will eat through them really, really fast. In fact, I forgot to do that for a supply stack, so I'm going to do that real quick off camera so I don't forget. Where is it? Hmm, I don't see it too. That's annoying. There should be a stack here with low ammo, and I don't know where it went. Oh, it's way over here. Well, I'll get to that later. I don't want to make this stream too boring, or make this video too boring. It's already there pretty bad enough, right? So, now, um, the Defender announces their terrain choice. There's only one terrain in here, open ground, so that's fine. And then we determine the initial odds, which could change, and we'll get to that soon. So to do that, both sides tally their odds. Uh, this is 10. It looks like 20, but because this unit's taken step loss, it's 10. And 4, so that's 14. The Defender, who I am going to have to investigate here. 13, ah, uh, but, yeah, it's 13 plus 12 is 25, but that is halved because they're disorganized. So it is actually, I want to say 12 and a half, and you do not round down just yet. So 12 and a half to 14. Um, and what you do is you take the lower number and divide it into the higher number, and that's the odds ratio. Um, in this case, the, and you round up, or, and then you just round the fractions, like if it's less than a half, you round down. If it's up higher than a half, a half or higher, you round up. And so the rounding rule makes it easy to calculate the odds here. It's one to one. And so the trick here is that in this combat table here, there are several rows of columns. <laughs> there are several rows of odds. And essentially, open terrain is the same column as of 1 to 1 odds as 2 to 1 odds is in close terrain. So it's easier for the attacker to get odds on, the, um, on open ground, is the notion there. So before we do that, though, I'm going to mark this one, one. I'm going to roll a surprise roll. The attacker and the defender, oh yeah, you identify the lead attacker, and it's going to be the large unit here. The attacker and the defender identify their lead attacker, which I just retroactively am going to do, and it will be the 1333 three here and the 243 there. And you compare action ratings. The action rating of this guy is 4. The action rating of this guy was three, but reduced by one because of this organized result. So it's a difference of two. I add two to this surprise roll. The surprise roll essentially is going to determine if a side gets column shifts in their favor. A uh, the column shift being that one to one odd could suddenly become um, could suddenly become like two to one or three to one or the other way, depending. Essentially, if I roll a five, if I roll a five or less, the defender is going to gain a surprise. If I roll a ten or more, the attacker gains surprise. These numbers are more likely in um, an overrun where it's six and nine rather than five and ten, which is why the if you have a high action rating unit against lower action rating ones, overrun combat's favorable, but trickier because it costs movement points. So we're going to take the bowl. I rolled a 8 plus 2 is 10, so the surprise does happen, uh, with four column shifts to the right. 1 to 1, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1 odds now. So the attacker has huge surprise on the enemy. So then we're just going to roll two dice, 
and add that action rating again, that difference. And that's the only modifier we have to this roll, which is really nice. And then I look on the table to see what the result is. So use the dice, pull. 10 plus 2 is a 12. Um, a 12 on that column is the attacker gains exploit 3, and the defender loses 2 and has an option of 2 and is disorganized. That is terrifying for the defender. The Russians are in, in a bad spot. So first I'm going to mark exploit is essentially two adjacent, up to two adjacent units or one stack of units gets an exploit marker. This puts them in exploit mode and if they have an action rating higher than that exploit number they can go move during the exploit phase essentially pressing their attack. The defender has to lose two steps and the first step has to come from I should have got my tweezers has to come from the lead unit which is the 13-3-3 so now it has taken a second step loss then the second step I can choose to opt where it's taken um, so that is going to be from the other unit, so both of them can survive at least, and I don't lose in a unit entirely. So, mark this unit with the step loss marker as well, and you just slide it under the unit, indicating they've taken one damage. And then these units, if they were weren't disorganized already, are disorganized again. And then they have to retreat up two hexes away from these guys. So one, two. Easy enough. They'll retreat into the rough terrain. That's really the only spot they can retreat. I guess they could retreat into the, in the hills, not the rough. Pretty sure those are hills. Now, there's a rule if, um, have they re had they retreated into an enemy's zone of control, uh, they would have taken the extra damage and made all the other friends in their stack disorganized. I do not think these guys did, did get disorganized when this group runs into them uh, with unless the enemy had zone of control. So we have exploit there, which is really nice. And then the defenders can advance after combat. I want to check if both units can do that. I forget Rules flipping is a key component of this game, which can be hard if you don't know where your rule book is. I did not find my uh, the series rule book. I probably put it all the way over there. I did. So the series rules say about advance after combat, which is thankfully uh, put in a very obvious spot. The rules is written in like case points and stuff, which looks like legal documents, but it does make it easy to read, easy to find out where you're seeing rules. Like it, capital, it marks each section pretty well. Advance after combat. Um, if the defenders are retreating, uh, the attacker can enter the um, defender's hex. Those have to be attacking units, the ones that actually contributed to the combat strength, blah, blah. It, now, I don't have to do this for regular combat. I would if I was doing overrun, and I can choose which attacking units advance. So I guess both units have the option. And I think I will happily... Well, if I move both, then they're not going to be able to get supplied for the next combat, which is bad. But... Yeah, because there would be a gap here, and trucks trying to reach there would have to stop. So I'm going to move this guy in. It's open ground, perhaps. Now, I could leave a breakdown unit here. Yeah, I'm actually going to do that. Oh, this guy? Yeah. 
So when, you, when a unit can advance that has multiple steps, they can leave, they can take a step loss to leave an extra unit called a breakdown unit behind, in a sense, uh, a leftover part of that division. Breakdown unit has to have an action rating equal to or lower than the division that just split it. And that lets me keep supply quite well. And then, since these units are both going in, I'm just going to mark them both under the same exploit marker. I'm using tweezers because this is an incredibly tiny this is an incredibly tight spot that my chubby fingers can't get through. Come on. Yeah. There we go. And so this guy can, has to throw a supply this way. That spot would have to stop truck movement. That's fine. So they'll be able to go again. Do I want to do any other combat? Probably not. Um, so that's what a combat sequence looks like. Um, and then I'm going to do that for the rest of the board. This group, there's not going to be any other fighting across rivers or stuff here. The axis feels pretty comp, is going to just leave it be. Um, and then we're going to do some exploit combat later, where essentially any units with exploit markers and any units I leave left in reserve uh, can be taken out of reserve and join in on, another, on essentially a second movement and attacks phase. Um, it's bonus moves. Uh, so I'm going to do the rest of the combat step and tell you how it all comes out. I'm not going to do it for every cube. Let me show you what's left. Unsnap this camera. So zooming out here, anything, so that was that red cube. We have all of that including that glare, but see all these red cubes? That's everything left I have to do fighting for. All the way down there, so I'm not going to record all of that, but I figured I'd show how combat works in the operational combat series. Thank you for watching. So to wrap up the combat phase, um, had a lot of battles, but it went by fairly quickly because it's not as much humming and hawing as movement. Got a lot of exploit results, especially in the north map. Um, we have this unit right here, who I'm going to slowly grab. Yeah, broke into this, so these guys are going to be able to move again. Uh, they tore apart that enemy, if I recall. There was an enemy there, it's gone now. Not much combat on this side. Over here, um, I had combat right here, got an exploit result, and an exploit result right here too. Fought, fought. So we got, these guys are approaching the HQ. This guy's, this Russian unit's disorganized. Good times, good times. Um, more exploit, more pushing in at the HQ as well. So we're getting pressure right here. And there's some reserves that'll be released in the exploit phase. Over here, if I recall, not much going on. I don't think I even fought in this segment because there was not really any reason to. Um, I have all of my plans in the reserve uh, uh, with exploits by using the reserves. Uh, there was an attempt at a fight here, kind of failed. This guy was trying to fight this guy instead, lost a unit, um, or at least took a step loss. No, yeah, I just outright lost a unit there. And then down here, no combat, no supplies, and didn't want to spend any. Uh, a lot of these units are in low stock, uh, internal stocks, because I uh, didn't have supplies. So instead, I just took in the reserve ammo. I think this guy's in low stock, but he got uh, took a town this place. That's cool. Um, actually, that did have supply, but yeah. Spent some supply, took a town right here, got exploit. Not sure I didn't fight those guys. I might actually now... Yeah, I actually will fight those later. Um, I'll do that roll real quick. We'll see whatever it turns out to be in the exploit phase. Uh, there isn't any fighting here. 
didn't feel like it. Uh, not enough supply and not enough movement. Not enough benefit. Over here, um, piercing the front line, there was like an enemy here, so enemy here, so now it's like whoop. And hopefully uh, that'll turn into good results. Got some reserves that can make a nice pincer arrow from there. Um, uh, didn't do much attacking here in the combat phase. Um, just precarious situation. There's a lot of rivers and stuff here. Also, that map is so confusing right there. All right. As we go down, no combat, no adjacent units, no combat there too hard. Um, but over in this peninsula in Crimea, um, not there, right there, I tried to do some bombardment on those hedgehogs, which are like wires and natural defenses and stuff, like trenches. Um, and those units tried to attack, they just ended up taking a step loss and didn't really go anywhere. And that guy took a step loss, so it's kind of a stalemate right there. That's the combat phase. Really nothing to it, just um, picking, picking my fights. But it's not as hard as like the movement phase. So that's the current situation. We'll do exploit phase next, though I will resolve combat right here. And I'll just update that in the exploit phase. Uh, cheers.